Hi, everyone. Great. Just uh, while I get, before I get started, uh, how many of you have used or recognize and have used one of these? Okay, excellent. I'll sort of expect that from around the Bay Area. Um, uh, the bottom one. So this is, thank you, dangerously pointing at my face, yeah. Um, hi, I'm Dan Archer. Um, I'm also from, not from around here. Um, funnily enough, I also live in New York and uh, left England um, eight years ago now, and I'm indeed pretty depressed by Brexit. Um, but let's not go there. Um, I, uh, I have a, I have a, uh, a VR and augmented reality um, uh, storytelling agency based out of New York called Empathetic Media, and uh, I'm here today to talk a little bit about the work that we do, um, the sort of the journey that I made to VR from uh, comics, and uh, particularly around the sort of the conceit of the frame and how uh, reimagining some of what we touched on in the, in the group discussion yesterday, uh, notions and theories and methods around immersive storytelling can sort of really help in shaping the sort of stories that we're telling. So um, without further ado, everyone recognize this by any chance? Okay, maybe one person, great. Um, so this is, um, I thought I'd always, I always try and temper any talk with, uh, about virtual reality with a little sort of caveat. If this doesn't, if the Wi-Fi holds up, hold on. Virtual reality will grow. Just as the telegraph grew to the telephone. As the radio to the TV. It will be everywhere. Having delusions, Job. Struggle for reason. Great. How do we prove Pierce Brosnan wrong? Now, is, is there no better way to start a talk? Um, so, yes, um, the one caveat that VR I'm very excited about, but at the same time, I hope to show both some of the advantages and disadvantages and how we can sort of, as this space is very embryonic, we can be thinking about some of the hurdles that are imminently going to come up and, and address them. Um, hopefully um, in a way that is more accessible and, um, to all. So um, sort of spinning back from the very high tech to the very low tech, this is a sketch I did yesterday, uh, good old pen and paper in a sketchbook. So I actually got my start as a graphic journalist doing live sort of courtroom illustrated reportage. Um, I have an MFA in cartooning. And, Darwin, um, it's just it, one of... Oh, hold on, that's my internet finally waking back up. <laughs> yep, great. Um, so I got my start, yeah, doing, doing these live sketches and all about a very sort of tactile um, response to um, recording what's in front of me um, through just pen and paper. As you can see, all the quotes up there are um, uh, direct quotes in the speech balloons, and um, it's, a, it's a very, obviously, it's kind of a candid representation of my one single perspective inside a room. And I've been using this to chronicle um, nonfiction and journalistic stories for several years. So these are actually stories from a project that I'll talk about a little bit later, um, directly from my sketchbook. Um, it's about the peace process in Colombia. And um, one of the advantages that I've often found is as you're doing these live sketches in front of people, not only does it sort of force and necessitate a, a sort of a slow um, response and a slow process to gathering people's stories and treating them with respect, but it also allows them to be more part of the reporting process. So they can actually see the, the way they'll be represented. Um, often people sort of feel quite flattered. It's not, it's not often that you know, some strange white guy, um, foreigner, turns up out of blue and draws them. Um, and, and so in a lot of ways, it sort of facilitates this conversation and, and in a lot of ways can build trust. So um, here on the left, he's talking about, um, uh, he says in the top left, uh, this, whole pr this whole town, uh, this whole village has suffered. Um, the, the, uh, the life was very ugly, uh, very painful, and they said that, you know, you've got to treat blacks like blacks. So he was talking about very specific um, sensitivities, and uh, I felt that, um, and not only did it necessitate the fact that we could not put him on camera. People are very aware um, that, you know, repercussions can come back from their images being recognized. And so in a lot of ways, it can preserve the sort of the power of their stories whilst uh, retaining their anonymity. Similarly, the guy on the right uh, is actually talking about, and you can see, you know, as the interview sort of progressed, I got more and more quotes, um, but he was talking about being kidnapped by um, the FARC, the left-wing guerrillas. 
And I've actually used this much in a similar way to Dan, uh, Dan Goldman um, and his great work from yesterday. Um, these are actually stories around um, a restorative justice program that's happening in Colombia. Um, and these are live sketches from some of the, um, the circles where people are sharing their trauma and, their, and their, their stories of how they're trying to reintegrate back in society. And again, it's just a very, a very simple, sort of more prosaic way of representing people's stories and trying to um, use these visual storytelling methods to share them with others. So I did, I've done similar work, um, and I believe passionately in the power of like, the visual um, to, to share these stories and give them a sort of a wider audience. This is actually a sample project from um, a sort of a huge project that we did in Nepal um, on human trafficking, bringing stories of, uh, of women um, as well as men um, and, uh, and children who had been trafficked in various different forms of human trafficking, both sex trafficking, domestic servitude, forced labor, um, kidney uh, kidney trafficking. Um, and one of the other advantages, you know, is the fact that comics can be easily translated. So this was, um, this appeared on the world, uh, world service and was translated into several different languages, um, as well as, and we were adamant about this, making a, um, a printed version that was used on the ground um, in, in Nepal. And it's actually part of a white paper that we then released through the State Department, measuring the impact of different forms of visual media um, at raising awareness in low literacy um, populations. So we compared comics to text, to um, an animation treatment, to a radio treatment. Um, and interestingly enough, and I can talk your ear off about it, um, we found that um, one of the big differences is that we were measuring positive versus negative messaging. So typically the messaging is, you know, don't be trafficked, your life will be over, look at these terrible people, they're victims, you really don't want to be like them, um, obviously paraphrasing very reductively. And we, we actually used examples of women and, um, and survivors that had gone past that and, you know, found work afterwards, reintegrated themselves after a very sort of painful process into their domestic populations. And it was those messages in our longitudinal study that resonated longer and had more impact with populations. So we hope that that will lead to a change in messaging. Um, moving into the interactive sphere, sphere this is actually a, um, a darkened version of what I can see, but um, a screenshot of um, a piece I did around the Nisur Square shootings in Baghdad. Um, in Iraq, and basically it involved the, uh, the contractor group uh, Blackwater, now known as Z or XE, and, um, and the deaths of 24 civilians um, at a traffic roundabout. And uh, effectively what you can do, and this is built in Flash, um, so uh, the, the, each of the different red, each of the different components here represent different uh, participants in the scene. And what I wanted to do was sort of juxtapose a variety of um, contradictory narratives in the same visual space. So here you can see the yellow uh, represent uh, civilians, the green are the Iraqi traffic cops, and the red are the Blackwater troops. And by scrolling through the interactive timeline at the bottom, you can actually jump from second to from minute to minute across the 15 minutes of the incident and look at the respective, again, the quotes that I then illustrated um, with rollover comics panels. Um, and one other big advantage here is that you, by clicking on some of the panels, um, I wanted to play on the fact that you can embed multiple layers of content. So by clicking on the red link here, it takes you to the source material, which was a, um, a cable that was um, published by the US Embassy in Baghdad. So I've also incorporated video and animation. Um, this is actually a story um, I did for um, the Canadian uh, Broadcast Corporation, CBC, um, telling the story of a, um, a survivor of an assault um, who was, uh, she's homeless and part of the indigenous community up in Canada. And um, all the stories, again, were perpetuating this idea of a sort of a victim, third person. Uh, Marlene Bird was her name. And she was, you know, they were always, they would always start with these sort of epithets, breaking down um, a description of her and then what happened to her. And so what we did instead was we, um, we told the story as, uh, from her point of view, first person uh, using drawn um, animation, which we animated. So these are some of the examples that Empathetic Media has done. Um, we, that sort of gives you a, a sort of a, a quick baptism of fire in how I got started through the drawn medium. Um, we've now brought that more, um, more closely aligned into VR and AR. Um, some of the work we've done, um, we, we're not you know, specific or loyal to any one medium, and we believe obviously that every story can, um, ha has its own strengths and weaknesses and should be suited to a particular approach. So um, I'm gonna talk, first of all, about um, 
Well, before I get started, I wanted to talk about the difference um, between 360 and VR. And naturally, hopefully, this will work. So yeah, excellent. So I didn't um, actually make this, as you can see, but this is essentially the big difference between um, 360 and VR. 360 video, you're effectively, you're rooted to the spot, and you, cannot, um, you can't move around, right? A video texture is wrapped around you inside a sphere, and, um, and your only sort of ability to interact with the space is by looking around. Um, whereas virtual reality, um, which is often conflated with 360 video, you have full immersion, you can walk around. Um, some, in most cases, you know, you're tethered to the spot, but there are obviously like room scale versions, like the HTC Vive, where you take one spot, you take one um, step, and it equates to a step in that virtual environment. Wait for it. Okay, great. So this was actually the first um, project that we, um, that we worked on um, back in 2014. I was doing a journalism fellowship in Missouri, um, and I actually arrived in Columbia, Missouri, 10 days before Michael Brown was fatally shot by Officer Darren Wilson. And um, so I, I went down to the scene, and what initially struck me about a lot of the reporting was that not only was it very sort of he, he said, she said, but there wasn't any um, spatial exploration of, of the scene and the location. Um, there was a lot of um, chatter about um, alleged distances and um, you know, uh, perspective taking, but in terms of a geographical, um, a geographical understanding of who was standing where, that, that, that really just wasn't covered. And so we, um, we endeavored to, when I went down there, I took a huge number of photo references and having originally conceived of it as a comic, I then actually rebuilt the scene in Unity, um, a game, a, the 3D game engine, um, to allow users to explore that space themselves. So this is a little demo of it. Um, and one thing I will say is that, so we made a fully interactive version for the Oculus, uh, the DK2. Um, this is a spherical video, you all obviously now understand the difference, um, walking through that scene. So this is just to give you a sense of what the space is like. You have just arrived at the Canfield Green Apartments Complex in Ferguson, Missouri, soon after Michael Brown was fatally shot by police officer Darren Wilson. Your goal is to explore the environment by walking into three different kinds of beacons. Colored beacons will display comics of the eyewitness testimonies that were broadcast by the media immediately after the shooting. White beacons will display photos of the evidence gathered by forensic investigators, and black beacons will play audio of the eyewitness statements made during the grand jury trial. So in the interest of time, I know I've got to speed things up, but um, effectively, the mechanic works that you have total freedom of movement, and you can, as you move to different spots where the eyewitnesses were respectively standing, you then, as you move into their space, you hear the audio, which we hired a voice actor to record um, the transcripts from the, the grand jury trial, and then we had 3D models of uh, which sort of... Um, illustrate what the voice is telling you. So he was standing here, um, I saw him run towards him aggressively, or I saw him running away um, fleeing. And uh, we wanted to give users the agency to be able to pick and choose effectively to reconstruct how they might make sense of a situation. Um, very similar to Adam's talk yesterday, you know, mentioning that Rushamon example. And that was really one key area where I wanted to, I thought that the mechanic and the freedom of virtual reality allows people, you know, fundamentally is tied to the, to the notion of narrative. And so you, um, that said, we did find that some people did prefer a curated experience. And, and in a lot of ways, it's very interesting that people um, equate that journalistic role as a curation of experience. Um, so they were like... Um, they would say to me, well, where do I go? What do I do? Which, which order should I do them? And I said, well, it's your, your choice. And a lot of people were, were sort of overwhelmed by the, the tyranny of choice. Um, so we, you can see we made a sandbox version, which was totally open. And then there was indeed like a guided version. So we also made a mobile version, um, which rather polemically was rejected by the App Store on the grounds that incited racial violence. Um, <laughs> So if you want to read more about the article that I wrote um, in Ars Technica, that's the bit.ly link um, at the top. Uh, but it, it, you know, particularly at a conference called Books in Browsers, I think it is, it, you know, we cannot stress enough how, um, in a lot of cases, these, uh, the App Store um, platforms, um, and obviously there's more than just Apples, um, are increasingly editorializing the content that's being, producing, uh, that, that's being produced. And so I really hope that more browser deployment can get around these sort of walled gardens, and uh, it's like a critical juncture now where we need to be thinking about access to the sort of stories that we tell and who should decide um, you know, w which stories can, can make it out or not. 
So in terms of the Columbia project that I mentioned at the beginning, um, this, um, to go into more detail about it, um, this is um, a pioneering restorative justice program being rolled out um, outside of Medellin. It started in the prisons, actually. Um, the the, the organization is called the Prison Fellowship, the Cofraternidad Carcelaria. And they basically, um, they bring together opposing sides, former enemies, um, in the in the 50 plus year um, conflict. Um, so you have the, uh, the FLN, the, uh, the left-wing guerrillas, you have the AUC, the United Self-Defense Forces of Colombia, the paramilitaries, and civilians caught in the middle. So they sit around over eight weeks and share their stories um, through a very structured program um, with a view to forgiving each other. And so what we wanted to do was recreate that environment in CG. These are modeled in Maya and then imported into Unity. Um, uh, to allow people that can't be present at these, these, uh, these sessions to, to share these stories and recreate some of the stories that are being shared. So this is um, from the point of view of Carlos, one of the paramilitaries who, uh, who was involved. Uh, this is Mary talking about her experience of being um, on a bus. So this is all first person perspective, um, sitting on a bus that she was then later um, you know, removed from for suspected um, uh, sort of aiding and abetting the guerrillas. And then again, this is Carlos talking about how he got the call when he found out um, about one of the, the, the murders of one of his relatives. And so we, I'm going to see if the, if the internet will work. Let's see. Oh, actually, I just, so this is a local version that I, just in case. Um, hopefully, hold on. So you can see one of the things we wanted to do is actually marry 360 video with that CG component because still to some, the, the computer generated aspect can have a, a sort of an uncanny valley um, um, effect. And that's where the closer you get to realistic representation, the sort of the more jarring it can be. Um, we, it's interesting. I mean, from a comics point of view, um, many have said that a more symbolic approach to, um, to representing um, to representing people allows people to actually project themselves more, um, more easily into some of these environments. Um, and so here you can see you're given the choice. This is, again, obviously just a demo, but you're given the choice to whose story you want to see. And uh, this is Renzo introducing the program. En cierta manera, hacer un acto simbólico de reconciliación. So it's in Spanish because what we wanted, what I did is then I, um, um, for some of our rollouts, we've taken Google Cardboards with smartphones because that's how you work. You just that's how they work. In the 96. And put it on the radio stereoscopically. In toda la zona del Oriente Antioqueño, afectando más los municipios de Cacorná, San Luis, San Francisco, Granada. Esta vereda fue muy afectada por. Apologies for issues. Right, so you can see here, so effectively what's happening here, the computer is breaking, um, is um, a, a CG version of the story that she's telling. Um, she's talking about being witness to, uh, to a massacre at the school that she worked at. And I'll just kill the sound. Um, and then we actually combine that with then 360 to sort of really reinforce that sense of this is a real place and this is... Um, you know, uh, this uh, has, has its roots in a physical reality. So I really wanted to sort of um, underline the fact that this is not just the, the province and property of big budget Hollywood studios and um, advertising corporations that, you know, our goal and the whole hope and ethos of Empathetic is that we are trying to make this more accessible to uh, a range of storytellers, not just those with huge wallets. Um, so, in terms of representation, we're also playing around with uh, photogrammetry. You can see the, the quality and fidelity of the scans are significantly higher, but then, you know, it brings up concomitant um, uh, lovely issues with optimization, um, particularly when it comes to real-time rendering. Um, and in terms of environment, we've similarly been doing that in terms of um, allowing for interactive spaces. So, this is shot... Um, uh, this is a screencast of a 3D scan of an environment of a room, and um, we we then optimized the um, the poly, the um, the mesh that that was a recording of the room to allow people to walk around and just sort of um, include very simple um, interactions. So you can turn the computer on, you can uh, turn the light on, that sort of thing. Um, so I also mentioned augmented reality, and like I said, um, we're not sort of married to one approach or the other, and in a lot of ways, um, augmented reality can be um, uh, more communal and, and sociable. 
Um, and we think that you know that obviously has its huge advantages um, compared to virtual reality, where you're you know you have an HMD and you're sort of locked into it. So one of the stories that we did um, uh, through our app that we built, uh, which is you know subtle plug on the uh, on the iOS and App Store, um, we we tailored um, custom built experiences to our clients' logos. So one, for example, was the Washington Post. We wanted to use this again this spatial aspect to show different perspectives on a news story. And one of the first we did was around the Freddie Gray arrest. Um, uh, a, uh, a young black man from uh, Baltimore, Maryland, who was arrested and who died in custody. And um, when I went there and was sort of interviewing some of the um, some of the folks who were eyewitnesses to the scene, you know, a lot of them said that the, the, this idea of the nickel ride, where you're placed in a in a police van and then it's accelerated and breaks and can cause concomitant injuries, um, it's very hard to sort of try and describe that. Um, so what we did is we transposed it into an augmented reality space, hopefully, and give you a quick demo. Neck injury inside a Baltimore police van during his arrest and transport on April 12, 2015. Officers again place Gray on his stomach and he flails his legs and screams. So that's the arrest position he was placed in. Officers remove Gray from the van. They replace the handcuffs on his wrists and shackle his legs. So again, um, it's just a, it's sort of a, um, a, a different way to conceive of these different forms of media. Um, so bringing it sort of full circle back around to um, one of our latest projects, we're actually telling the stories of um, those who live on the outskirts in some of the informal settlements around Dhaka in Bangladesh. And it's um, actually sort of more of a transmedia approach. So it's marrying comics, um, as you can see here, taking testimonies from um, some of the garment workers who work in... Um, uh, this is actually taken from uh, reporting of uh, some of the garment workers who worked at the Rana Plaza um, garment factory that, that collapsed, um, and combining it with 360 footage. So this, is, um, this was shot at the Tongi factory collapse um, in September um, when we were there. Um, and this is, I was going to show you a 360 video very quickly. Um, but again, so um, we're, this is part of a, a collaboration with... Um, Taka's informal settlements on its northeast outskirts and home to some of the factories that pollute the adjacent waterways. As you can see from the pink rags that have washed up on this riverside. Okay, interesting. Um, it is not, obviously not just a photo. Um, um, <laughs> uh, and effectively, what we wanted to do is, to, like I said, take this sort of transmedia approach where we're combining a comic that you begin the story in and then saying, if you want to read more, then go into, um, then go into the video. Um, one, of the, you know, one of the issues um, it, with 360 video is that, um, again, it's a whole different set of conceits that allow you to inhabit the space. So you need a bit more time to sort of situate yourself in that space. Um, you don't want to do too much narration because people will sort of be overwhelmed. Um, and you can't have, um, you want to try and leave things to a more sort of discoverable, okay. Um, you want to try and leave things so they can be more discoverable rather than just sort of directly um, expositional. So this is a 3D scan of one of the rooms uh, involved in, um, in the story, uh, one of the protagonists, Abu Hanif. And uh, oh, you can see, of course, it's working now while I'm talking to you. So that gives you a sense. This is uh, Shohag. Um, he owns a tea shop um, in, um, in Gawea. And this is, so we've been working with um, a company called Matterport, um, based out here. Um, whose website is just a black rectangle, it looks like. Um, no, there, there, is a, there is a 3D scan, um, I promise you. Um, and basically, what this does is it creates that mesh um, that we then work with to allow people to explore it. So um, here it comes. Um, and this, again, it's um, our partners. So we're partnering with uh, Die Zeit in, uh, in Deutschland, as well as uh, El País in Spain, uh, Internationale in Italy, um, and, uh, and hopefully the Magnum Foundation for the English version. And it's all about, again, creating this sort of series of chained pieces of media that can be experienced autonomously, but I do work best as a sort of a comp composite. I'm gonna let that load in the background happily. Um, so last but not least, I'll just mention some of the potential ethical hurdles. I'm not sure if any one of you saw this story. Um, uh, best intentions, basically, you can file this under. So this was the Norwegian immigration minister who, who trying to recreate that sense of what it's like to be an immigrant. 
um, a refugee, um, you know, fleeing across the ocean, put herself in a in a in a what looks like a wetsuit and uh, threw herself into the ocean and sort of lay there as uh, media took millions of photos about her and. Um, uh, you know, um, basically, took the, yeah, took the Mickey out of us. So there are there are better ways to do it, um, and there are a lot of there are a lot of ethical concerns when it comes to putting yourself in other people's shoes. Um, something that I'm very aware of. This is a great Instagram profile, uh, Barbie Savior. Um, I'm very aware that you know, with this new technology comes a great deal of privilege, and um, access to it is still quite high. You know, a lot of this tech still costs quite a lot. Um, not to mention some of the reporting processes that we're going through, walking into environments where you know. Um, especially if you bring in a state-of-the-art uh, 360 camera rig and plonk it down and then have to leave the shot because otherwise you'll be in the 360 shot, can be disconcerting and can create that effect of um, further reinforcing the barriers and boundaries between populations. So um, there's actually a wonderful um, uh, sort of a first pass at the, an ethical code of VR practicing practices um, uh, out of um, the University of Mainz in Germany, um, home to Gutenberg, um, which sort of again brings it full circle, um, that you can check out, there's a link to it there. And so last but not least, I'll just say that um, uh, we're currently actually working on a pioneering study at the Tau Center at Columbia University, which is gonna measure the impact of, um, uh, or basically try and find the metrics for links between 360 video um, and, uh, and empathetic responses. So it's to actually find um, uh, both quantitative and qualitative measures of audiences' responses to the same story told in an HMD, a head-mounted display, as well as a desktop, as well as um, purely just text. Um, and we're rolling the study out uh, later on this month. Um, so thank you very much. Sorry if I went over. Thank you.